Hare Krishna Yogeshwar Prabhu. Thank you very much for joining today once again. So. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's an honor. You know, it's so many times we have had the podcast and I think this is your library with the your Cornet IDTs. It's one of the things which I've seen so many times. So, um, along with, of course, having <laughs> your association. So thank you for making times on so many occasions, Prabhu. And I think today we will discuss something related with the DTs that you also have. You yes. mentioned to me... A... <laughs> So you mentioned to me about the book you are writing now currently, the book on Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So I found that whole project fascinating and I thought we could use that as a takeoff point for discussing the challenges and opportunities in writing a biography within the Bhakti tradition of a devotional character. Is that okay with yes. you? Yes, a good idea, an important topic. Yes, true. So, first of all, what, what inspired you to take up this topic? Well, by profession, I'm a biographer. Most of my books have been biographies relating to the Holocaust period. Uh, the story of um, survivors or lawyers who prosecuted Nazis at the end of the war. Uh, books about war crimes trials and mostly testimony by witnesses to the Shoah, as it's called in Hebrew. Mm. But also, as you are aware, I made a biography of George Harrison and was privileged to do a biography of Srila Prabhupada also. Mm. And uh, so I listen carefully to feedback. You know, p people write me or they contact me and what i was hearing was that they liked that the stories particularly the Prabhupada biography uh, they said it, it humanized him now i'm using that word very carefully of course we we're cautious to uh, honor srila Prabhupada as a, a shaktivesha avatar but um, what inspires us are events that we can identify with. So the challenge there was to humanize his story, so to speak. And now I'm trying to do the same with the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Okay. So, so now the, as you said, the word humanize can itself be provocative. So I think the word has two different connotations. One is there's a famous Puranic verse that Guru Shunarmati, to treat Nara is man or human. It is a hellish mentality to consider the Guru to be like an ordinary human being. But at the same time, so, so you are not, if I understand right, you're not using the word in that sense. You are using it in the sense that is a, is a humanly relatable person. That, that in one sense, we relate with others by seeing their humanity. That that's when we, otherwise we may, be, we may even have some awe and reverence for somebody who is very powerful, a great achiever or something. But when we see the similarity to some extent between what they are experiencing, what they are going through. So is that what you mean by humanizing? By humanizing, I mean making someone accessible to people who have no background in that person's history or identity. Uh, you know, that, that same kind of logic that you just applied to the word human, we could also apply to the word person, for example. We say Krishna is the supreme person. Well, what do we mean by person? There's a, you know, these ontological complexities, you know, the, the, the meaning of language with changes over time, which changes as we grow and mature and age. Things don't mean the same to us at this point in our lives that they did when we were children, for example. So certainly um, my job is to, put myself in the place of the reader. And by reader, I mean a general readership, not a devotee readership. I, I don't think I've ever written a book just for devotees. I, I can't say that. Um, our, our duty, our responsibility is to reach out to people beyond the walls of our own institution. So I try to do that with my books. Okay. Uh, 
So that that's the criterion. That that's the main motivation is to reach people where they are, not assuming that they have any interest, even let alone background, and create a story that will absorb them. That they'll say, "Okay, I'm interested in this. I'll I'll dedicate some hours of my life to reading about this person, whether it's Prabhupada or Chaitanya Mahaprabhu." How to do that? That's a big challenge. Mm hmm. So the so that raises the question: Why would somebody not consider? I mean, is there something which would make people think that Prabhupada, that Prabhupada is not means? If uh, let me put it this way: That why would we need to humanize him? Is he not humanized already, or have we? Does that in the insider circles within say the devotee community? Do we portray? a non-humanized picture of Prabhupada? I mean, am I making my question clear? Yes, it's very clear. And the answer is also very clear. You know, we are our own worst enemies. We, we have institutionalized Prabhupada. We've institutionalized Krishna. We've institutionalized Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to the point where they are relevant only to people within the institution. How do you make them believable? How do you give people a point of tangency with these personalities if the only thing that you do is present them within the, we can call it the hagiographic hey context, you know, within, within the, the, the religious context of, of uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavism? That's, I think that's a disservice. It may be respectful, the motivation may be good, but I think it works counter to the whole notion of bringing the teachings of Prabhupada and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to the greater world. We can't assume that people are just going to be open to these ideas. That, 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 that's, a, that's a disservice to, to Prabhupada's mission. Our job is to find a way to bridge the gap between the internal, highly religious view that followers have of these great personalities and the points of interest by people who are not part of that tradition. And any great work of literature does that. You know, there are great works of literature uh, uh, about Jesus, about uh, uh, great mystics from the past, but they're generally books that are not written by followers. You know, the, the, those books tend to be quite, um, uh, you know, praising and glorifying these people in a way that is presumptuous for outsiders. So I have to, my job is to step back away from my own belief structure far enough that I can, in my words, humanize these great personalities so that, if you will, non-devotees, will have a, a reason to read about them. Other, you, you may have the greatest truths in the universe, but if no one's interested, what good will they do? Okay. But in one sense, our movement is a missionary or a, you could say outreach. You don't want to, you, the word preaching has somewhat fallen to disrepute. So in one sense, isn't the whole purpose of our tradition to make itself accessible and uh, presentable to, in, accessible and intelligible to the world? And isn't that what we are all doing? <laughs> okay, that's one of those trick questions that, that can really get me into a lot of trouble. <laughs> okay, uh, I can skip yes, that if you want. that's what we're yeah. supposed to be doing. <laughs> okay. you know, and, and I, but I think sometimes we get, um, I'm going to say this advisedly, I, I think we get lazy about it. We fall into cliches, we fall into patterns of language and thinking and thought patterns that are comfortable because they're familiar. You know, it takes all kinds to make a movement, you know, and, and I believe the majority, I would say the majority of people who are followers of Krishna consciousness are there because it's comfortable. They find it pleasing. You know, they find it satisfying. The tough work of, of predication, the tough, tough work of outreach is not comfortable. It's very uncomfortable. It means removing so yourself from your place of certitude long enough to be able to listen to what other people are saying, 
become sensitive to their interests and concerns and identify, craft a language, a vocabulary that will reach them where they are. If all we do is speak to people in the language that we know and are comfortable with, we're going to be waiting a long time for this movement to reach its full potential. You know, I'm, I'm, for example, I'm privileged to be on the board of directors of the Bhaktivedanta Institute in Gainesville. I'm very proud of what devotees are doing there. They're, they're working mightily to find a scientific language with which to present Shastra conclusions to a non-devotee public, and they're having great success with that. Hundreds of, of scientists are now becoming scientist practitioners thanks to their efforts. I'm trying to do that in literature. Okay. So if I and context and contextualize what you're saying is that we could say there is the movement, many devotees are just happy being in the movement, and then we we accept the insider vocabulary, the insider terminology, even the insider way of thinking. And then we just present it to others. And there are, of course, devotees who are trying to do outreach. But then if you are going to reach out to a broader audience who's not really directly interested in us, then we need to understand where they are coming from, understand their language and consciously use their language. Um, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, I would go further than that even. Because embedded in the way you raised that question are assumptions that I think are a bit precarious. The assumptions are that we've actually resolved these things for ourselves, and I don't think we have. Look, I'll, I'm going to be 72 next month, right? Mm -hmm. And after 50 whatever, five years or whatever it is, of practicing Krishna consciousness, I'm finally getting around to asking some of the tough questions. So better late than never. But I know from my own experience, there are things that we've never really wanted to tackle about our participation in Prabhupada's movement. Not everyone. I can't generalize like that. You know, I've learned to be very cautious about generalizations, universalizing things. Let me speak for myself and some of my colleagues and friends, that there are profound questions that have been very difficult to ask, let alone try to resolve, because they're complex, because they're uncomfortable. For, let me give you an example, and this relates to the work that I'm trying to do on this biography of Shaitanya Mahaprabhu. The, the, the ecstasies and the mysticism of the experiences that the people around Mahaprabhu have and that which he himself have according to the uh, classic literature, you know, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Chaitanya Bhagavat, Chaitanya Mangala. There are maybe a dozen biographies that were written within the time frame of Mahaprabhu's life and for the over the next century, of which we, we don't have all of them. Some of them we know by reputation, but there are no copies existing. So there may only be six or seven books written by people w within that first hundred years. And they're fairly consistent with regard to descriptions of the, these mystic uh, transformations that people go through when, when uh, Mahaprabhu reveals himself to them in, in sadbuj form. You know, um, here he is as Krishna and, and, uh, and so on. Or when uh, that uh, young Brahmin who came to stay overnight at the Mishra home was uh, offering food to his deity and little Nimai comes in, steals the food and then reveals himself to the Brahmin. And the whole house, the Mishra home, the bungalow, transforms into Vrindavan. So, you know, there are these mystic experiences and, and we, how do we, how, well, how do we absorb that? How do we process that? First of all, they're highly, pardon the use of this word, Hindu in their iconography. Mystic experiences from other traditions never describe the mystic as having visions of Krishna in his three fold bending form playing a flute. There's never descriptions in the Kabbalistic tradition or in the Christian mystic tradition 
of, of, of people seeing Vrindavan. So how do we understand the specificity of that visual context? Is, is it that everyone else is wrong? Of all these other traditions, they've got it wrong. And the only real, true transcendental experience is seeing Krishna in Vrindavan. Is Chaitanya and the descriptions that we have in these six or seven books, the product of their environment? Ha, ha, is it Chaitanya who fashioned the tradition or the tradition that fashioned Chaitanya? I mean, these are, these are tough questions and not easy questions. You know, we, we have to, because they affect our relationship with people of other faith, they affect our understanding of reality, of the nature of the universe. Can um, you just repeat, sorry? They affect a lot of things. Can you repeat that again? Did Chaitanya fashion this or the, to fashion the tradition or the tradition fashion Lord Ch Chaitanya? What do you yes. mean by that exactly? Well, which, which came first? The image of Krishna in Vrindavan, which then Mahaprabhu and his entourage realized in, in, their, in their ecstasies. Or... Uh, in other words, there was a context that already existed, a cultural context, an artistic and um, iconographic context. And then these realizations of, of higher states of being conformed to those images. Or did Mahaprabhu reveal something for the first time and, and the tradition has evolved from there? Now, that that's a somewhat semantic question, right? I'm I'm not saying that there isn't a way to answer it. I think you and I would probably describe an answer in the same way. But what I'm yeah. saying is, you know, there are tough questions now. And I mean, and I understood, um, I understood the first question that you know the very specific or uh, specific uh, visions that we have are they the only visions of transcendence? That that's, that's clear enough. But from our perspective. We, we do consider Krishna to be the ultimate reality, and it is Chet Mahaprabhu is loving Krishna. So, well, the Krishna who had appeared earlier, now Mahaprabhu is envisioning this. So, in one sense, from an outsider perspective, oh, both they 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 could reject both as uh, both as uh, as say figments of imagination or as symptoms of a psychological breakdown or whatever deconstruction explanation they give. But why would the which created which be such a serious question? All right, I, I'm, I don't know whether I gave a, an awkward example of what I'm trying to describe or not. And we can pursue okay. this if you wish. Okay. But the, there's a, 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 a larger point that I was trying to make okay, here please. with Again, regard focus to... On, and focus on that, please. Yeah. yeah. The, the question is, how do you write a biography of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that non-devotees will find interesting? That's the question. Okay. Right. So, so my question not just earlier interesting, was, but something yeah. they might even consider for themselves. How do you no. talk about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in a way that people outside of Gaudiya Vaishnavism will say, "You know, I, I, I'd like to consider that for myself." That that's the challenge for me. And when you write a biography of Chaitanya, it's so culturally specific. It's really asking people, come inside our world. The question is, does this relate to their world? That's the question that's challenging me every single day. And I've been writing this book for several years now. How do you make this meaningful? Look, Prabhu, 99% of the world looks at devotees. And if they're, I mean, I believe people are generally good and they look at us and they, they may be sympathetic to what we're trying to do and so on. And there'll always be a certain community of people who will take to Krishna consciousness because they like the kirtans, they love the prashadam, they find the community environment wonderful, and the philosophy is satisfying. If you drill down on some of these things, if, if you go further, if you say, okay, what about the other vast majority of people in the world? Are they lost to Krishna consciousness? How do we reach them? 
the non-believers, the people who aren't predisposed to mysticism and 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 to to yogic uh, transportation. You know, I mean, how do you how do you reach rational, logical thinkers for whom the lingua franca is science? You know, mm. science is real. You can test it. Here's mathematics behind it. Here's the equations. Here are the formulas. You can do the uh, experiments again. You'll get the same result. That's real. Mm -hmm. Now give me something in the life of Chaitanya that I can do that will convince me in the same way. Very difficult mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. So you know, people in look one... at us and they say, you're, you're Hindus and then God bless you. Good luck to you. But it's just not for me. Hmm. So, so I like the phrasing you said that in one sense, outreach is we are trying to invite them to enter into our world, but that requires a significant level of commitment. And before commitment, we can say even there should at least be some curiosity or at least relevance. Otherwise, they will not even explore. So and to, to trigger that curiosity, we need to, in one sense, show that our traditions, teachings and our traditions, uh, uh, we could say iconic characters, they also can be presented in a way that enters into their world. Yes, but I'm going to go back to what I said a moment ago. Uh, I, I, I accept the question that you're asking in the way you're phrasing it. But again, I think there's an assumption embedded in the question, and that is that we ourselves have reconciled ourselves with that greater context, with that greater architecture of creation, and that we've resolved these issues for ourselves to such an extent that we actually have something that other people can relate to. And I'm not sure we've done that. Look, let me give you a, a, an example from my own life. Um, when I was maybe 14 or 15 years old, uh, my mother was in uh, public relations, as it was called at the time. And one of her clients was uh, the scientist Murray Gelman. Gelman, who I think passed away 10 years ago or something like that. He, uh, uh, Gelman received the Nobel Prize for his theories in, in particle physics uh, in 1969. He's known for his book, The Jaguar and the Quark. So when I knew him, it was a good four or five years before he received the Nobel. And I just remember being absolutely fascinated by this man, by the way his mind worked, by the way he was able to travel down inside the realm of, 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 of particles and, and elements of creation, forces of, of, of matter that we can't see, to envision how these pieces work, how they fit together. I found that absolutely fascinating to, to explore the world around us in such a way that, that, that the human in, intellect can em, envision things that happened billions of years ago, that may happen billions of years into the future, that may happen on scales so far away that we will never see what they look like on scale so small that we will never travel down deep enough to see them with our own senses, to imagine realities beyond our sensory purview, but which can be proven through experiment, through mathematical calculation and equation. That appealed deeply to me for reasons that I still don't understand. <laughs> Just a few years later, when I was 19, I met devotees. And I became involved with Krishna consciousness. I don't think it's, if to be quite honest, I don't think it's because I found something that was more scientifically convincing. I don't think it was because I found something that was more intellectually compelling. I think I found something that was emotionally compelling. I think I found something that was communal in a very appealing way. And that was a long time ago, you know, and, and, and I have to, I'm, I'm at a point in my life where I've got to confront certain things that I just, 
I think I was either afraid to ask them, or I didn't know how to ask them, or it was just more comfortable to ignore them. But writing this book, examining the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I tell you, Prabhu, this is such a difficult, uh, rewarding, but um, difficult, difficult challenge. Here, may I say something? Uh, you're, you're bringing this out of me, and I thank you, I think, for doing that. Um, my impression, looking back over my many years as a devotee, is that we have mythologized these great personalities. I know I did. I, Krishna and Radharani and the gopis and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the Panchatattva. These, these were all divine characters that I, I had no idea how to relate to them as, as people. How do, how do you relate to this? I'm going to use this word advisedly to a mythology, which I do not mean in the sense of something invented or false or fake. I'm using the word myth in its highest sense as a reality that is so profound that it rises above everyday levels to achieve a, a, a place of, of, of metaphor, of, of iconic imagery. So not false, but something hyper real, if you will, beyond reality as we can perceive it. Okay. Uh, two things here mythologizing I, in one sense i'm doing two things over here i'm also trying to make sense of uh, your ex or correlate your experience with some of my experiences and i'm also trying to make sure that what we are saying is is relatable to our viewers so mythologizing because like earlier you used the word humanize which has a different connotation and you are using it in a different sense so you clarify this a little bit so again, mythologize, we use it in such a sense that we make them such an object of reverence that a real relationship becomes very difficult. And when we are saying that, when you are trying to write a book to make, say, Mahaprabhu relatable with outsiders, the underlying issue that came up that we have not yet resolved ourselves is that have we have we actually made Mahaprabhu relatable for ourselves also? It's that we, while trying to make him relatable with others, we need to make him real and relatable for us, ourselves also. Did I phrase it reasonably well? I think that's, that's accurate, or at least it's coming very close to what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say, I'm admitting to you, is difficult to say. I'm not sure I've ever expressed this publicly before. I'll give, let's see if I can give you a practical example from the work on this Chaitanya biography. I'm finding where, where I can write freely, where, I'm, where I can write wholeheartedly, is when uh, Mahaprabhu, for example, is in discussion with others. When he's in discussion with Sarva Bhattacharya, when he's in discussion with Digvijay Pandit, when he's in discussion with Chankazi. I can go inside those moments and I can evoke what I'm calling a humanness that endears, that I believe will endear Chaitanya to others. For example, when, when he um, confronted Kazi, you know, Chan Kazi had, had uh, sent his soldiers to disrupt the Kirtan for reasons we can discuss, more political than anything else. He was under pressure from Nawab Hussein Shah to maintain the peace and make sure that the Hindus were cooperating and behaving properly. And there was also pressure from the caste Brahmins, but um, he was out of line. He overstepped his bounds. You know, John Kazi came with soldiers on a barge and they arrived at Srivasa's place and they basically beat them up. You know, they broke the Madangas, beat them up. And Kazi told them, uh, whatever you do in private is your own business. But if I find you doing this again in public, I force you to convert to Islam. So the Mishra home was only a few miles away. Someone ran, 
told Nimai, still Nimai at that time, what, what was happening. And he responded instantly by organizing what I believe may have been the first, first certainly was the first full-scale kirtan, public kirtan in history. It may have been the first organized protest against, uh, let's call it, religious discrimination. At least I'm researching that. I'm not sure I'm finding anything on quite that same scale. So he, he, he galvanizes the entire community. They do this nighttime protest with torches. I mean, can you imagine the Kazi standing on his palace balcony, seeing this ocean of people coming at him with torches and drums blaring and cartels, and, you know, people shouting. And I must have been was terrified. So he goes and he hides. <laughs> Mahaprabhu arrives, does something very smart. Obviously, everything he does was smart. He sits down by the door of the palace on the floor, which he did talking to Prakashnanda Saraswati. Also. He always took a very humble position. He sits on the floor, the place where the people keep their shoes. Right? Some, of the, some of the protesters go, they find the Kazi hiding, they bring him down. Then Chaitanya and uh, Nimai and the Kazi begin to have a, a conversation. First, Nimai says, I, I, I was hoping to see you, but then you ran away. So, uh, and, and Kazi's kind of shaking there, looking around, on this huge crowd of, of angry people. And he says, well, you and your group seem very hostile. So, but you're here now, I'm pleased to receive you. And then they sat down and they began to discuss. And the way they held their conversation is so heartwarming. It's so beautiful. First of all, Kazi says, you know, we have a connection. Yeah. Your, 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 uh, your father-in-law, and, and uh, I called him Chacha. You know, he, he was like an uncle to me. And so we have that connection. And, um, and, and then he makes a mistake, I think. He says, so, you know, among family members, when there's a disagreement, you shouldn't take it seriously. <laughs> he's, he's kind of trying to dismiss his own bad behavior. Right? Hmm. So here's Nimai. He's got to come up with a response to this that does several things at once. He's got to make clear to Kazi that, no, this is not something to be taken lightly. What you did was serious. He has to do it in such a way that he does not alienate him. He has to do it in such a way that he can allow the Kazi to retain his dignity. He can't humiliate him in front of all these people. And has to do it in such a way that he perpetuates the movement, that he restores legal justification to the Sankirtan movement. So what does he do? He knew that Kazi was a scholar. Nawab Hussein Shah honored Chan Kazi like his own guru. That's how much Chan Kazi understood the holy and noble Quran. He was a scholar of Quran. So Mahaprabhu says, I think you and I share much in common. So he's, you know, this is good mediation. You know, he's establishing common ground. He says, you and your tradition and I and mine, we honor the creation as a divine thing. We honor life as sparks of God. And, and we, we, we praise God and, and worship God, each of us in our own way, in our own languages. So I don't understand something, and I hope you won't take any offense, but I need to ask you, we, we drink the milk of mother cow, we eat foods that are made from grains harvested by the bull. Should we not honor them as our mother and father? How is it that in your tradition you can justify eating meat? So now what has he done? First of all, he's, he's honored Kazi as a scholar because he's raised the conversation up to a level of, of, of exegesis, you know, of, of, of comparative scriptural analysis, right? That calms the waters. It's no longer about what you did to my people when they were chanting Hare Krishna. He brought it up to all other. I have to, I mean, I could go on with this. It's such a beautiful moment that in the end, Chan Kazi promises to become vegetarian. Can you imagine? And he says, from now on, all of my descendants, if they ever 
cause you any problem, I will disinherit them. <laughs> what, so here's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Nimai at the time. Such an amazing, compassionate person. And that people will understand. That they will appreciate. Visions of the spiritual realm, uh, you know, that's, I think that's down the road for most readers. You know? <laughs> so I, it's an easier time for me when I can describe Chaitanya interacting with people. Mm, so let me, this is beautiful. Let me uh, get, uh, articulate what I understood is that in this particular narrative, the, the warm interactions between the two of them are something which not only can people relate with in today's world, but actually they can also be uh, like a model or an inspiration of how people who are having a conflict coming from different faiths can resolve it in a yeah. amicable yeah, way. It. Okay. Yeah, you got it. That, that, that part of Chaitanya's humanness, I'm using that word intentionally here, I think people can relate to. And and he does that time and again, you know, he, he with um with Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, that, that's such a loving moment. Oh my gosh. Brings tears to my eyes. The way the way he honored Sarvabhoma. Sarvabhoma was was the a leading Navya Nyaya scholar. Mm. Logic, logic and, and and rational thinking, which actually was a influence from the European renaissance we that's a whole other thing <laughs> but he was stuck sarabama was stuck in his rational thinking mm. and and what chaitanya did was to open his heart <laughs> and and uh even though he was an older man i mean sarabama was no spring chicken as they say you know when, when when he realized, oh my gosh, <laughs> even the great Shankara was actually bringing people to devotion, you know, through incremental steps. These are the things that that uh, by now he is a sannyasi. Chitani is describing for Sarvabhum. It opens his heart. The, the the hard callus, that wall of of logic that had encircled Sarvabhum's heart, cracked open. And for the first time, he was able to appreciate devotion. That he too was capable of loving and being loved. That emotional world that had been held at arm's length for so long. Mm -hmm. This is the thing to understand. What, what is it about the rational mind that makes it such a dangerous weapon? <laughs> is that it distrusts the human compulsion toward feelings. Feelings are to be distrusted, right? The heart is a fickle organ. Better to focus on the mind, the brain, the intellect. That will give us the straight and narrow path. What does that do? Well, it, it builds this antipathy, this suspicion of emotion. Why did Chaitanya Mahaprabhu fall into dust such disrepute? in the 400 years following his passing from this world because people thought he was just a, 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 a an emotionalist or a romantic they didn't appreciate how emotion can be intellectually grounded that's my job now i have to bring this out and it's it is a bear of a of an assignment in the previous past time or in the previous narr narratives, previous incident, we could say see, every one of these incidents has many aspects. Like with the, even the Chandkazi pastime, you know, we could go into the specifics of how they destroyed the Mridanga, the specifics of what the what how the devotees marched across. Now, some of these could be very specific to, as you said, Hindu religious iconography. But the human interactions are very easily are something which people can relate with. Now, with respect to the Sarvabhoma pastime, the 
aspect of mahaprabhu uh, mahaprabhu's devotional ecstasy n- not being some non intellectual or anti intellectual sentiment but we could say it's almost like a trans intellectual sentiment he is fully intellectual in fact he is more than a intellectual match for Sar- of sarvabhauma but he has something more so in one sense the narrative itself can give some credence okay he is not a sentimentalist i said then then he is experiencing something maybe there is something genuine about it but what is it that is genuine and how do we explain that that is still a challenge do i understand right what you are saying yes that's precisely it i mean um it helps to know the back story it helps to know why john kazi did what he did you know from a personal political socio historic perspective why he had he felt compelled to stop the party and why he did it in such a dramatic way what is the back story to sarvabhauma bhattacharya what was his history what was he dealing with as a human being again that same word coming up what was he dealing with as a human being that made the vaishnava school of thought so uh, uh distasteful for him right and what was it that occurred when he spoke with chaitanya mahaprabhu and it's important also to see that it was only at that moment that he had this revelation that chaitanya revealed himself to sarvabhauma that sarvabhauma had a vision of chaitanya as as krishna the mm-hmm. time and again we're reminded and i'm still exploring this i'm still trying to figure out how to explain this revelation occurs most of the time not always but most of the time when you are prepared to receive that revelation revelation isn't some kind of haphazard accident you, you, okay it takes work it takes work for for me to understand my deities as something more than the external form that i relate to the work is within me that has to get done i'm the one who has to come to a point of saying i recognize there is more than the empiric realm that is true and real and necessary and absolute i accept i will set aside my intellectual reservations and i will interact here even hypothetically this comes from prabhupada's introduction to his bhagavad gita even hypothetically i will accept that this is truth and i put myself in that position of being a servant of my deities and that i have the privilege and the right of speaking with them of behaving with them as though they are living beings because they are of revealing my heart to them of asking for their help and when you do that long enough and sincerely enough that deeper reality begins to emerge at least this is my conviction this is my understanding of prabhupad's teachings it's a practical thing you go on chanting strip away all of the calluses that cover the heart open yourself up to that greater mystery of creation and one day this deity will speak with you that that's my faith now i just have to <laughs> find a way to explain it to to people who aren't wearing tilak and tulsi beads hmm that's amazing so you we are not just telling the in one sense the story of a particular character uh, even if the divine character but in telling the story we are actually making the the whole theology and uh, culture and the lived yep. tradition accessible you got it you got it it's the whole thing it's the whole enchilada it's the whole nine yards mm. <laughs> <laughs> and and my point again is i don't think 
I'm speaking for myself now that many of the people I know who are involved with ISKCON, involved with Krishna consciousness, have bothered to do this exercise. I, I think they've reached a certain plateau. And I don't blame, this isn't a question of blaming. I'm not, I'm not criticizing. You know, this, each of us is on our own particular path. Each of us evolves in our own way. We confront the, the obstacles and the hurdles to our own spiritual progress. And I, I truly do not believe that Krishna consciousness is one size fits all. I just don't. Do this and you'll get that. That's such a material idea. It's such a simplistic way of thinking. That's not what... Chant, offer your food, distribute some books, and you're Krishna conscious. Really, I mean, if that's so, why is it that so many seasoned disciples of Srila Prabhupada have all gone away? Where are they? He initiated 5,000 people. Where are they? We've had millions of people come through our doors. Where are they? Now, I'm not saying they haven't benefited, but I'm saying that there are deeper dimensions here <coughs> that, that we must be prepared to look at. Maybe, I, I think this is a function of age, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, as I say, you know, 72. It's not exactly the end of the road yet for me. <laughs> yes, I hope not. But... You hope that you are there for no, this a long, long things. time. Yeah. Well, thank you, but I, I am taking things a lot more seriously. And I'm asking myself the hard questions. Really, really, really hard questions. These are not easy. It's not, I mean, well, all right, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Fu. So let's, uh, how should I put it? So, so these are, in one sense, can we say Prabhupada in his Krishna book also tried to do it to some extent when he took Krishna, I mean, instead of placing it in the Bhagavatam, he just published a separate book. Of course, uh, he was focusing more on narrating the 10th canto, but to some extent, Prabhupada also gave some philosophical buffering and context to some of the pastimes, which could be, which could, could be incomprehensible or even misunderstandable. Yes, I mean, thank goodness that he thought to do that. You know, his life mission was verse by verse, Bhagavatam, translation and commentary. But because he didn't know how much time he had left, he gave us summaries. You know, teachings of Lord Chaitanya was a summary of Chaitanya Charitamrita because he didn't know, if, would he live long enough to do the entire work? Krishna book, summary of 10th canto, he didn't know how, how long he would live so he gave us that summary and thank goodness he did that and you're absolutely correct his attempt at every step was to make this transcendent world more imminent to to make it understandable for us in the in the life the life we live and he passed that responsibility on to us that's our responsibility as well is to find a way to convey the teachings that people can understand but i think before we can do that we have to understand it and and i question that i challenge people to to determine whether they've actually gone sufficiently deep into their own relationship with their life as devotees that they can speak with a full heart and open heart and with a language that other people can understand and appreciate uh, again, I, you know, I, I, this is not to, to minimize the extraordinary accomplishments of devotees around the world. I'm amazed when I see what's going on, how ISKCON is growing so beautifully, how people in Prabhupada's absence are still becoming devotees. I mean, that's proof of the success of his mission. All these things are wonderful. I just know, look, here's the thing. I, I spend my work days talking with educators 
with lawyers, with judges, with law professors, with um, uh, historians, you know, and, and I, I speak to them from my particular academic background, which is the Holocaust period. Hmm. Maybe I'm overly sensitized because of that to the parameters of what makes for an effective presentation. That's possible. And I may be uh, overly sensitive to how most of the time, I, I would dare say, Krishna consciousness is presented in a way that doesn't respect certain parameters. There are too many assumptions made that people will understand what we're talking about. You know, you and I can have our conversations and talk about preaching and about, you know, deities and karma. And we assume that the majority of people watching your podcasts will know what the heck we're talking about. That, yes. That's a little group of people, you know, there's not very many people. Hmm. True. So actually, this brings me also to the history of the podcast, how it has evolved. Uh, originally, we were thinking about, uh, and one of my closest friends and senior devotees, Shaman Pru, we used to have a lot of discussions about how to present Krishna conscious uh, wisdom in a contemporary way. And as we were discussing this, we decided to make it a podcast and share it. But then soon we realized before we can discuss about how to present it to others, it is we who need to understand it ourselves better. And it's not just I'm talking about we in a condescending that other devotees have to understand it. We ourselves have to understand. I myself and have to understand it better. And so in that sense, we could say that in one sense, sharing, in intrinsic in the process of sharing is also rediscovering or re-examining or appreciating better and man and if we are writing about it then it's much more that we need to critically i mean critically may not be the best word we need to carefully examine what it is that we are saying and how is it intelligible how is it rational how is it relevant so i think to some in a micro in a small level i also have that experience of what you're saying mm -hmm. So yes, yes. So two yes. things, yes. So now, if we can also say that there come, from, there are two strands of uh, experience that you have. One is as a devotee, and you have had uh, a lot of extraordinary experiences as a as a leader of the in the movement. As a you mentioned that you have been a president and I have been quite, you have been close to Prabhupada in France and seen him closely. So you have that strand of experience. And then you have your uh, professional strand, strand of experience where you have, inter, where you have, uh, as you said, written by, bio, made biographical writings and documentaries and others. So do you see, in one sense, both of these culminating in this particular project that you are doing, writing this book? Oh, absolutely. The, this is the culmination of my of everything in my life. Maybe what you've done is put your finger on 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 the the, the bottom line here, the core of what we're talking about. Each of us is gifted with experiences in our lifetime, with training or education of one kind or another. It it may just be that the the work of the future is to learn how to honor those experiences as the tools of our spiritual progress by learning how they apply to our way of being in the world. That there's a language of medicine, there's a language of law, there's a language of community planning, there's a language of technology, there's a language of science, there's a language of mysticism and we bring our particular language our particular background to to uh, to our careers as devotees so yes yes absolutely i don't think it's a matter of we haven't understood what we know deeply enough i think it's we haven't figured out how to explain it to others <laughs> the, the basics are the same 
the basics are always there. But what is the contemporary mode of expression? You know, and it, it's specific to our arena. I'll give you some practical examples if you like. I mean, sorry about that. Yeah. What I've found in well, what I've found in writing, in 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 the work of crafting something that has literary value, is to always put yourself in the place of the reader and make sure you're keeping their interest. Mm. Right. What is it that's going to interest? So, so for instance, for myself, I find. I find it interesting when I learn something from what I'm reading. So whether my book is a biography of a Holocaust survivor from concentration camp Auschwitz, or whether it's the life of Srila Prabhupada, or whether it's the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I like to bring readers inside that world by evoking the smells and the sounds and the visions. What is it like to actually be there? And then pull back, let the camera, almost like cinematically, let the camera pull back away so that you're describing what's going on in the rest of the world. For example, there's one moment in the biography when Chaitanya is just a young boy, Nimai is a young boy, and he and his friends are playing the story of Ramayana. And, and uh, 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 Nimai takes a, a branch of a tree and he wields it like a bow. And he's, you know, Rama going to fight. Ravana and his friends are cheering him on the victory of of good over evil. Then the the text in in, in the writing breaks, and the next paragraph begins. Meanwhile, five thousand miles west, there's another kind of victory going on. So there's a bridge there, and I bring readers inside the Renaissance. I bring readers inside this explosive expansion of rationalism this move away from religion this move of course many of the renaissance naturalist philosophers were religious but this was a time of exalting human intellect exalting our ability to solve problems on our own not because the church has told us what to think and do but by our own examination of the cosmos you know this was the time when we discovered that the earth is traveling around the sun instead of the other way around and and that there's how 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 the anatomy of the body is working and and we're not seeing any soul in there we're not seeing any divine beings in the universe so it's the it's the celebration of of the potential of the human mind right? so by by contextualizing this, now you're beginning to see what is Kali Yuga? What is it that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come to, to confront? Mm -hmm. It is this stripping away of God and transcendence and divinity from the life of the human civilization. That's Kali Yuga. What do we mean when we say that Chaitanya is the Yuga avatar? He's come specifically to address the victims of Kali Yuga. What does that mean? So the book follows these two narratives. It's Mahaprabhu's life and it's the rise of Kali Yuga and, and how these two energies confront one another and what it means. So, yeah. Mm. So that, this I mean, is what I'm Kali, trying to describe for you is writing tool. Yeah. Writing. So, it is, uh, in one sense, uh, you know, I read in one place about writing, there's this ladder of abstraction where you start from a specific and then you go to, a, a sp to the universal. So the, the specifics are often very, the specifics in themselves are not universal. So we take the specifics, we go to the universals and we again come to the specifics, we again go to the universals. That's that dexterous going up and down the ladder of abstraction. The specifics keeps it interesting, but the universals keep it relevant. And I, uh, I think that's what, uh, that's what uh, we need to do when we are trying to present our tradition. And uh, even, uh, but that, but the bridge you have to yeah, use the word bridge also earlier. The bridge we have to scale is huge. The specifics may be interesting for some people, but then the Taking the what are the universals from there, and how can we present? How can we present them? That's a significant challenge. 
So yeah, what you've said is very important there. Very, you have to remember what we're asking of people. I mean, we are taking them so far, <laughs> so far away from anything they think is real and true and 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 rational. So far away <laughs> that if you don't do what you just said, if you don't do, give them something specific and relatable and 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 familiar they have no reason whatsoever to read your book to hear what you have to say we're meaningless to them so for instance i'm finding and i hope i'm right about this that one of the things in this biography that may be appealing to people chaitanya mahaprabhu's life is about the experience of separation and loss and grief it's separation and loss and grief over the death of his father, over the loss of his elder brother. It's ultimately the separation of, and loss and grief over being separated from Krishna. His heart is breaking, breaking. Well, we, we can't understand that Mahabhava, but we can understand separation and loss and grief. Every one of us has probably lost someone we loved. Every one of us has been separated from someone we loved or grieved over some sadness that has occurred to someone we love. That we can understand. So is that somehow breaking the rules, you know, that you try to give people access to what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is going through by relating to something that we may experience? I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, I think that's actually the way to people's hearts, the way to open the door to their at least considering Chaitanya is by giving them something in their own lives that they can say, uh, I, know, I know what that feels like. Mm. So does that mean that there is a significant part of, uh, like there is the, tra there's a, the tradition is a huge, aspect, the tradition itself is huge, the, the biographical literature around him is also huge. So, uh, does in, in trying to present Mahaprabhu to a contemporary audience, will it be that some aspects of his life will just be too, too big a bridge to scale? And that are there some aspects you felt that it's best to leave out right now and later when people become more familiar, then they will deal with it? Mm. I can't, I'm not, I don't have enough time that I can afford to do that, that I can afford to leave anything out anymore. I, I, it's now or never, <laughs> let me put it that way. If I can't explain this, I have to be able to explain it for myself. And then maybe I can explain it to others. And I've postponed it, I will admit this to you. I've postponed for a very long time, confronting uh, how deep is my faith in this world of krishna consciousness you know what is it uh is it just that i'm comfortable with it? it it's my religion it's my you know you know it's my crew it's my people <laughs> this is what i do or is there some deeper ontological reality here that i'm willing to embrace and if so i better be able to explain it so uh, I don't have the, the luxury of, of, uh, of not explaining it any longer. That's why this is so difficult. Okay. Yes. Uh, so now we discussed one thing about the, um, the making the, so th there are two, three different obstacles. One is that in the tradition, we use a particular uh, terminology and uh, conce conceptual framework that maybe too otherworldly or too irrational 
for some, for most audiences for for people in the contemporary world today and then uh, with respect to that we discuss we also have to understand ourselves but while we are one other aspect of making things interesting is also you know, bringing the characters alive the settings alive the tensions alive so is there some level of artistic license that needs to be used and i i had read the mahabharat in my childhood and i had watched it on tv now i somehow in back of my understood my mind you know this tv is not as authentic as what the book would be now later on i when i was introduced to krishna consciousness then i read krishna dharma prabhu's mahabharat and i found it captivating reading but then when i went back to the sanskrit and the translation i found that he had uh, there were many things in his mahabharat which were like the you could say the inner dialogue or the inner thoughts okay in a particular character the particular dilemma what are they thinking so often the inner thoughts are not described so much in the mahabharat or not, not in so, so much detail so also sometimes the battlefield setting is described but he has described some more details also so i had talked with him about in fact i had him also on a podcast so he we had discussion about artistic license how far it can go and what all but what are your thoughts on this topic and how how have you used it or have you used it right uh this is a good this is a good point um any act of translation is is a creative act it's a creative act because words no longer mean the same that they as they did 500 years ago or 5000 years ago concepts change new ideas and words come into usage the um, language is in a constant state of evolution or devolution okay, when you say concepts change means the concepts that the people in the world think about or the concepts of of the particular uh, tradition hmm you know th- there was no such thing as climate change 5000 years ago yeah you no know, there was no such thing as as you know environmental disasters the words genocide mass murder you know crimes against humanity i mean you know these these were terms ideas concepts that didn't exist events may have met that definition in some way but there were things that just weren't applicable then that are true now and there are things that were applicable uh then that are not true now so um any act of translation is an attempt to time travel you're 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 in a sense doing something that's almost impossible trying to recreate today the substance of something that dwells in the past culturally sociologically historically and so on linguistically and so that in and of itself means that there must be some what you're calling artistic license i mean i, I think that's a problematic phrase for many reasons because it it suggests invention and i think there's an a difference between invention and contextualizing something in a way that makes history accessible um you can find equivalence in language that's different from the original but which is a legitimate way of bringing an idea or a term into a contemporary environment um i think the 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 issue here is one of the integrity of the translator the integrity of the author is there a purpose to demonstrate what a wonderful writer they are you know is there a purpose to get a book out and to be able to sell it and become popular as the author of that book or is there a purpose to be faithful as far as they are capable to the content and the substance and the reality of what occurred and and this is true across the board i mean you know, pulitzer prize winning biographies you know uh, doris kern goodwin's biography uh, 
no ordinary time uh, of uh, Franklin and um, Eleanor Roosevelt. Marvelous work of biography. She didn't know them personally. You know, she, she did an extraordinary job of piecing together the war years based on extensive research, extensive evidence. And, and because that's at least within certain proximity of her life today, it's very credible. Imagine writing something about a, a character from ancient history. When the cultural environment, you know, of Bengal in, in the 1500s, <laughs> that's so far of a stretch, you know, let alone Ramayana or Mahabharata, right? Mm -hmm. What? That's like some other planet. So, there, so that's the work of each generation is to bring that history into a contemporary language. You can't avoid that. That's unavoidable. The challenge is doing so in a way that is honest, that does not take too many liberties. For example, if I'm trying to describe Nabadweep in 1486, Nimai's appearance in the world, right? I can't just invent what kind of trees there are there. I had to do the research. I have to go and find what trees existed. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. if you were there in the in the Mishra compound, you know that it was a few bungalows with a, a yard and a gate. Uh, what were you seeing? I don't want to just you know invent it. You know, there were rose bushes and marigolds. I mean, you know. I, so I have to do the research. Now, how I present that, that's a question of my literary ability, my, my sensitivity to what a reader will find interesting and so on. So it's a balance. So then, so there are, when you're describing the setting, of course, you need to be, as I say, faithful to that. Even if, you know, in, even somebody's writing fiction of a particular time, even the fiction has to be real in the sense that you have to describe the time which you are, you have to be faithful to time which you're describing. But at the same time, something like the inner thoughts or the, you earlier said, of course, that the, every translation is a creative work. So... So, so the term artistic license, you feel it involves using something like a, it involves something imaginary, which is being brought in. Whereas what our author is doing is trying to make what is real, what really happened in a way that is really connectable with the current people, with today's audience. So for, so, so for example, the inner thoughts of a particular character how do we know those thoughts unless they're specifically given in scripture or in the associated literature coming with this? Well, I, I'd even go farther than that. I would say, even if they're there in the biographies, how do you know it's accurate? You have someone, Krishna hmm. Das Kavaraj, who's writing 80 years. He never met Mahaprabhu. He's getting reports from the Goswamis. He's collecting information. And then he's evoking this description of, I mean, there are dialogues, there's narrative of conversations taking place that how could anyone actually, <laughs> for page after page after page after page, say he said this and he said this and he said this and he said this. There was no tape recorder. So mm. at a certain point, we're dealing with um, revelation, realization. We're dealing with the intuitions of someone whose heart is pure and who is a fitting vehicle for these truths to be conveyed. You can't give that any empiric, substantive, you know, seal of approval. 
that that's a mistake that 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 that's a mistake there mm. there there comes a point when there is i mean this may be with the definition of faith after all not none of us was there none of us knows what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said from our own ears, we have faith. We have faith in the writings of Morari Gupta and the writings of Vrindavan Das and the writings of Krishna Das Kavaras and the writings of Rupa and Sanatan Goswami. We have faith yeah. that the, the truths here, the, the, the realities that we are reading about and that we embrace as part of our worldview are substantial hmm. but you're not no one's going to give you a contract saying this is actual history no no one's going to give you a videotape and say well here it is you can see it for yourself yeah. so you know at, at a certain point i think you know we leave behind the realm of you know contractual proofs if you will and okay. we enter a, a domain of, of the heart where, again, you prepare yourself and these things will be confirmed from your own inner realization. Uh, that, that's the best I can, I can, I can describe it. And I, I think, and I have this discussion with my brother a lot. My brother's a, a physicist. Yeah, he wants to know. I think the universe is smart enough <laughs> multi-dimensional enough to incorporate many realities, many levels of truth so that seen through a lens of astrophysics and cosmology and, and, and particle physics and so on, that is a truth. That is a reality. It is how things operate. And I don't see that there's anything threatening about that or anything somehow contradictory with the, you know, the Vedic perspectives or, or whatever. This is how it works. And you can test it, experiment it, and come up with the same result every time. The formulas work out. It is a reality. It may be a temporary reality. It may be an incomplete reality. But you shouldn't reject it. That's a perspective. That is a lens through which to see the universe. Here is another lens. We call it Krishna consciousness. And through this lens, we are able, when we are qualified, when we have prepared ourselves as instruments of observation, if you will, we can peer beyond the limits of the empiric instruments. That's a question mm -hmm. of revelation, realization, and so on. And in, in some respect, writing a biography of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I swear to you, Prabhu, it, it, it sometimes it comes down to prayer. It comes down to just begging. <laughs> mm. I'm, I am in way over my head here. You, you kindly help me. That's why I have my deity. You kindly help me. I'm trying to tell your story, right? I need your help here because I can't do this on my own. Hmm. That's so true. Ultimately, I mean, we, after all the discussion, we come to the, the, the prayerfulness, devotional humility, and uh, you, you can. I mean, I'm just thinking about how Prabhupada also, when he was on Jalduta, he's saying that I am unqualified. You make me dance, O oh Lord. So yes. you make my, make my words understandable to him. So in one sense, I'm thinking that that's what Prabhupada is also confronting that challenge. Literally using the words, make my words understandable to them. Yep. You, you ornament it. my words. Mm. I, would, I wish to be an instrument in your hands. You kindly use me, make my life meaningful by using me however you wish. I will never forget the first time I met Prabhupada. You put me in mind of this and I thank you for that. I came into the room where he was sitting. I threw myself on the ground, 19 years old. I look up. And he's, and I start crying immediately. And he's looking down at me without blinking, just looking at me, staring at me. Mm. 
And, and in that moment, if I were to describe for you what I think it felt like, it felt like he was saying, are you really ready for this? This is going to throw you for a loop. Are you ready? <laughs> it's almost as if he was, you know, saying, all right, you're, you, you think you want to sign up for this. Well, brace yourself. <laughs> Hold on, because <laughs> this is gonna be a hell of a ride. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, mm -hmm. okay, maybe one or two last questions. For, so, so just in terms of the book, how far has it come, and when is it likely to be published? I was afraid you were gonna ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> if I said to you, I've got 72,000 words in the computer, you know, most of my books run around 100, 110,000 words. So you could say, oh, well, he's, you know, you've got it three quarters written already. No. <laughs> no. The words are, are rough and ugly. You know, they're, they're there in the document. The hard work is cutting away, refining perfecting replacing it's very hard if you're if you're an honest writer it's very hard to be also be your own editor because it means it's like killing your child you know you have, you have to be able to take out entire chapters that that happened to me yesterday i printed out the manuscript and i'm reading it and i'm i'm horrified oh my god <laughs> did i really write this oh Oh, oh. <laughs> and, and to be willing to strip away the thing that you've created, you know, because it's not working. So I, I can't tell you, am, am I halfway there? Am I a quarter of the way there? Am I three quarters of the way there? I don't know. What I can tell you is that there are sections that are easier for me, as I was describing, you know, like Mahaprabhu's discussions with people. You know, because Sarvabhoma, I can identify with him. You know, he's like an old guy who got stuck in academia. You know, <laughs> I have a lot of friends like that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, they're so inside their own heads, you know, that they've, they've just, they've lost the juice, as we call it. You know, they would rather analyze the rose than smell it. Other parts are just so difficult, so difficult. And, and uh, for the first time, I think I'm having to do something that I swore I would never do. And then that's to put myself into the writing. I'm, I'm, I'm having to become a, a participant in the story because otherwise I don't know how to convey this to people. I think my doubts or questions or challenges, I'm not that different from the rest of humanity. So, I'm using myself, if you will, as the tool for exploring the issues. You know, I'll say something like, did Vrindavan Das really expect people to believe this? <laughs> he writes about it and he says, I'm putting this down because the great devotees who were there, they've told me these stories and I trust them. Really? What about me? <laughs> Okay. Am I expected to trust you? <laughs> were you? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a, I mean, you were there also in the Swami in a Strange Land, the Prabhupada biography, because a good number of your interactions with Prabhupada are what comprise the heart of the book. So, is this different? Or this is because no. you are not actually in the story, but you're putting yourself into it. That, there you yeah, actually... That's what's different about it. And also, whatever small part I might have played in Swami in a Strange Land. It wasn't confrontational. I wasn't challenging Prabhupada. You know, how do we know this is true? How do we reconcile this with that? You know, the different lenses. This is different. Prabhupada didn't display the kind of miracles that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu displayed. He didn't go rolling on the ground in ecstasy and, and you know, sh shooting out syringes of tears that moistened the ground and 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 uh, you know sweating blood and and 
you know, revealing himself and Saz Sadbuja. I mean, Prabhupada didn't do those things. He might have been capable, but he didn't do it in front of us. Now I've got to deal with that now. I didn't have to deal with that in Prabhupada's book. Okay. So do you expect that this approach uh, will raise some eyebrows among devotees or you are being balanced and you are trying to take care of that also? Mm, like, Say again? Say no, the question if, again. Uh, approaching Mahaprabhu is a revered figure from a somewhat confrontational perspective. Is that likely to raise some eyebrows in the devotee community? I hope so. You hope so? Uh, listen, I, I meant what I said a moment ago. I think most people haven't really embraced their own faith. I think many devotees, I, I use the word most advisedly, many. I can't say most. I don't know most devotees. I know some. I think many of them have, have for example, I was speaking with one devotee I love dearly, a dear friend, a contemporary of mine. I say, how do you deal with this? And he says, I don't anymore. I, I, you know, it just, it, it just strains my brain to think too hard about those things. I, I'm comfortable in my own faith structure, and I just go with that. That's a perfectly acceptable answer. But I can't expect my readers to go with it. I can't expect that to be the reason why they should read this book. Hmm. So, yeah, I hope this raises eyebrows. I hope this gets people involved with Krishna consciousness, saying to themselves, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe, maybe I haven't really looked at this deeply enough. How, how deep is my faith in this? Would I fall on my sword? and say that this is true, real, universal, correct for everyone? Or is it for me and those who think and act and behave and believe as I do? I don't know whether we've really confronted those questions. We certainly haven't done it sufficiently to know how Prabhupada's mission applies in the world today. That I know for certain. And that I'm on safe ground there. We have a long way to go in terms of the Sankirtan movement. A long, long way to go. We have just barely scratched the surface. We're just at the beginning of seeing what the Sankirtan mission can do in the world. That I'm totally convinced of. The future is bright and beautiful and miraculous and exciting. Of that, I have no doubt whatsoever. But to get there, we're going to have to confront these deeper issues. What are we all about and what do we mean? That's required. Mm. Yes, Prabhu, these are huge challenges. And I look forward to the book whenever it comes out. I'm sure so will our viewers. And this has been a very thought provoking, you could say, uh, introspection inducing, or you could say, self examination inducing kind of podcast, which is which is what many of our podcasts are, but this is more about a core divine figure in our tradition and how we understand. So should I try to summarize, Prabhu? You would like to add some points now or after the summary? Uh, please go right ahead. So today we discussed uh, the challenges of writing the writing biographies in Bhakti. And for you, this is what you have been doing throughout your life now well with respect to mahaprabhu the challenge was first how to humanize humanize him that not reduce him to a human being but make him accessible from a human perspective to others so how can we understand so then you give the example in that connection of how the personal dealings between uh, the sweet dealings between chandkazi and mahaprabhu are something which which are relatable but at the same time there are many aspects which are not just difficult to explain to others, but also which we may ourselves have not, not thought about deeply enough. And although in one sense as outreach movement, we are meant to present and share our traditions, wisdom and uh, our whole sacred figures with the world, we sometimes get comfortable within 
our own uh, circle, our own term language, our own terminology, and which can seem incomprehensible or irrelevant to people. So Mahaprabhu's, for example, his ecstatic experiences and his life at large, they are within a Hindu religious context with a lot of Hindu, with what people will see as a Hindu religious context and Hindu iconography. So what is universal about it? So that is trying to present that is a significant challenge. And then in that connection, we also discussed about the pastime of Sarvabhauma and how there is this transcendental emotions which are not non-intellectual or anti-intellectual, but trans-intellectual. So the, how do we explain them? And so through the narrative, what could be done and how it could be presented. So these are challenges which we evolve, will evolve. I mean, we I, I, through writing, you understand those challenges better and understand how to address those challenges. And with respect to artistic license, you know, it's not that we are... In one, at one level, we can say every translation of a translation is a creative act because certain concepts didn't exist in the past, like global warming and uh, genocide. So activities that were that could be called as genocide have happened in the past, but that term was not there. That concept itself was not there. Uh, that so in one sense there is always creativity involved, but the creativity is not just imagination. Because there is there is research required to ground the descriptions in fact. So, uh, what kind of agitation was there in in the times of, say, Mahaprabhu in Mayapur or Jagannath Puri? So these are things which have to be researched. And as far as uh, making say Mahaprabhu's life, you, you said that this is what in one sense. You know, trying to explain everything from Mahaprabhu's life, not leave some things out for the future. And there's a lot of prayer and uh, uh, self-exploration required. And you have put yourself into this book, sometimes in a confrontational mood. Uh, in a, so, so that uh, what will be incomprehensible to the readers, in one sense, it's also can also be incomprehensible or at least not fully comprehensible to you. And then that can be, that can create a bridge between us and readers. And hopefully that will also trigger greater thought among the devotees. And then there can be a deeper appreciation of Mahaprabhu in a way that is not parochial, but is universal. I mean, there's a lot of other things we discussed, but anything you would like to add specifically? That was very well said as always. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Uh, so happy to talk with you and look forward to your book uh, soon in the near future. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare